Yes, sir. This is B. Brian Blair, and I'm so excited because I'm going to be on Hannibal TV. And I'll tell you what, Hannibal TV is awesome. They are around the world. Kind of reminds me of me and my killer B friend, Jumpin' Jim. You know, we have been from Maine to Spain, deep down in the Ukraine. Matter of fact, we spread pollen from New York to Holland, and that's how we created the hive. You know, we've been coast to coast. We've been north, south, east, and west. But I'll tell you what, Hannibal TV. They're the best. This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com and I am with WWE legend, one half of the Killer Bees, B. Brian Blair, who is also currently the president of the Cauliflower Alley Club, which is a wonderful organization. And we're gonna get him to talk about that later in the interview. But how are you doing today, sir? Doing great, Devin. Glad to be here. I'm glad you made it out and you found your way. Um, and to start this off, could you tell us a bit about where you grew up and your childhood? Sure. I, you know, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. I was uh, one of the few white people in the area. If you know, Gary's 90% um, African American. And, um, you know, all my friends were black. And there was no color. I mean, Michael Jackson lived about oh, half a mile from where we lived. I lived in Etna, which abuts Miller. And the Jacksons lived in Miller. And, um, you know, back then, uh, Billy Kempinski, a Polish kid, everybody was either an Italian or Polish or black or white, but nobody cared. You know, I mean, everybody uh, helped each other and there was no racism and all the stuff like, uh, like, at least I didn't see it as a kid. You know, we were all happy together and we all got along great. I wish it could be that way now. And, you know, we went through the Martin Luther King deal, but uh, it seems like uh, people are perpetuating racism or that's kind of sad. But Gary, Indiana is where I grew up. It was a lot of fun for 10 years, 10 and a half years, and then we moved to Tampa, Florida. And I understand while you're in high school, you actually hold the record in Tampa for the amount of high school letters that you earned. That's correct. Three years of high school, I had three letters in football, three letters in um, wrestling, three, I mean, uh, I lettered in track, I lettered in, um, in um, baseball, and um, uh, nobody's, uh, nobody's been able to do that. That's pretty impressive all these years later. What is it, 30 years at least since you've been in high school? Maybe more. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> You're one of the wrestlers of that doesn't too. age, actually. <laughs> What's that? You're one of the wrestlers that doesn't age uh, that oh, much. Well, I try not to. You know, it's just uh, father time keeps ticking. Compared to someone like the Iron Sheik, for sure you look a lot better these days. Ah, uh, you know daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you were about to say you went to the University of Louisville mm -hmm. on a scholarship, I guess? Yes, uh, actually um, I went to St. Leo, Leo College first because I was going to the University of Tampa. They folded football because of the Bucks. You know, the Spartans were drawing 30,000 people on a Saturday night and they couldn't compete with, the, I mean, the Bucks couldn't compete with a, a winning dynasty where John Matuzak, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, uh, 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 Freddie Solomon, who the only person on the San Francisco 49ers to beat his receiving records were, uh, was Jerry Rice. Um, just a, a powerhouse Division II football team that everybody in Tampa loved. And uh, the Bucks somehow um, we don't nobody knows what they did but the theory is is that they gave the college a lot of money to drop football um, and uh, the college uh, University of Tampa then said that the athletic program the football program was bringing their academics down was that's what the reason that they used to fold football so I went to st. Leo College um, which isn't far from Tampa it's in up Dade City st. Leo about 35 miles north of Tampa. So I went there and played club football. We traveled around, which was a lot of fun. We played the JV teams like for Duke, um, Moorhead. Uh, we even, uh, I remember playing a game against Gallaudet College, which is, which is a deaf and dumb college. And um, kids were really, really nice. And we had this running back named Tony Leone from New York. And uh, he was a real cocky guy. And he was saying things, you know, because he knew that they couldn't hear him. Uh, bad things. I don't even want to repeat them because it's just not worth repeating. And anyway, to make a long story short, we got our butts beat um, by two touchdowns. And um, they taught everybody a lesson, you know. Um, everybody's wondering how, how are they going to hear the snap count and all that. And they have a drum on the side of the field. They have a big drum. If you've ever watched a deaf and 
uh, football team play football. And I don't like to use that word dumb. But anyway, uh, you know, you don't want the, they'll hit the drum like four times and they're either going on one or four. And uh, so they have a little jump on you because they can hear those sound waves quickly. So they were quick off the ball and uh, had a lot of heart. But we learned a lesson, you know, always be humble. And at what point did you start training for professional wrestling? I started training for professional wrestling, I think, when I um, first saw championship wrestling from Florida on WTOG when I was about 12 years old. Um, it just motivated me to start lifting weights and doing push-ups and sit-ups and everything I could. And Of course, when I was a kid, I, I went to uh, Big People's Church for the first time. and. Um, the minister was talking about the power of prayer. Now here I am a kid, I'm 11 years old, and uh, he really convinces me that if you're a good, earnest person and you pray to the Lord, that God's gonna answer your prayer. So I thought about that a lot. And I thought, well, do I want a Chevy Corvette or maybe a blue one or a red one? I couldn't think of what I wanted, a million dollars, now they'll take it from me because I'm just a kid. Finally, I thought, I know what I want to be. I want to be Superman. So I couldn't wait to uh, get home and pray that night. And I prayed to be Superman, obviously. And I kept praying and praying and praying to be Superman. And I tell the story when I mentor kids a lot and when I speak at schools. And, um, you know, I did pray earnestly. And I didn't become Superman with an S on my chest, big cape, uh, red cape. But um, I was able to... Uh, uh, be a professional wrestler and um, uh, didn't, I had a black and yellow tights for half my career and various colored tights but I lived on television and ran the ropes like a speeding bullet and leapfrog a man with a single bound and was able to take a body slam and have a 300 pound man jump on my chest and live to talk to the fans today so be careful what you pray for. <laughs> and definitely, you were definitely a high school sports superman for sure to get that record. Um, I understand you had Hulk Hogan's very first match. Yes, I did, in Chiefland, Florida. And, you know, in wrestling, everything's a rib. It's a joke. That's how you got by. It was the jokes that you got by. And so uh, we're practicing at uh, 106 North Albany Street in the Sportatorium where we grew up with Hiro Matsuda and get, getting stretched every day. And, boy, we went through tough, 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 tough training camps. And um, I did for three summers, three and a half summers. And um, the only three people that made it out of those th summers were um, Hogan and Orndorff and myself. Everybody else, Danny Spivey left, um, uh, Scott Hall, a lot of guys left, broke in other places or came back later. A couple, uh, Lex Luger uh, came in and Hero, um, uh, he was a little disappointed, but then, uh, him and Hero finally got along good, and he wound up breaking in in Florida. But um, Ray Hernandez, a lot of a lot of good, good, uh, solid wrestlers broke in um, in Tampa. But I, where, what question was I going to? Uh, the inf well, the famous, I guess you should say, match with uh, Hogan, his very first match. So Hogan and I are booked uh, in a 15-minute uh, time limit draw. They tell us what the finish is. Uh, uh, about uh, three days ahead of time so we go into the ring and we're practicing got our stuff down pretty good so I ride with the Briscoes and uh, kayfabe was big time then and uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, Hogan rode with Pat Patterson and Ivan Koloff and uh, a couple other the heels so we get out in the ring and pretty excited a little nervous pretty excited I, this, I had been working for about six weeks so I'm still green and of course it's Terry's first match and um, we go out and everything's going great, 10 minutes go by. Um, we're, the people are really into it actually. And uh, I look and I, got, uh, I have Terry in a rear chin lock with my arm grapevined around his arm and I whisper, I said, look, I said, look Terry, uh, everybody's out there watching us. And we look, and up both the locker rooms, uh, the heels are out watching, the baby faces are watching. He said, he said, he goes, yeah, we're having a heck of a match. Let's keep it going. So uh, we get up and we do another high spot. We're waiting for the, the minutes to count down because it's a 15 minute match. So they, we heard the 10 minutes go by and it seems like three minutes have gone by. And I said, Terry, we better kick it in. Uh, 
we're not going to be able to get the high spots in. So he, he does, you know, gets, he had gotten the heat, a little heat, boom, boom, slam me, miss something. I start to come back. We go into false finish, false finish, false finish, one, two, one, two, one, two, kick out. And we're just, our tongue's hanging out. And all of a sudden we hear 15 minutes gone, 15 minutes to go. So the guys had the announcer change the time limit to a 30 minute time limit match. And so we're stuck out there with our tongues hanging out. And that had to have been the worst match I've ever had. <laughs> wow. What was he like in those days? Oh, uh, Terry was great. I love being around uh, Terry. Uh, we had so much fun together over the years, and um, he's he's really a good guy, despite what you hear about him. He guys, when you're his friend, you're his friend, and he's um, he's been good, always been good to me, and um, I've always been good to him. And he was just a, a fun guy. He was played in a band called Ruckus, and he was a big suntan blonde guy that was just like a real freaking. I used to sneak into the bars when I was 17. You had to be 18. I'd sneak in and watch Terry play, and. I mean, guy was great. Did you have much contact with Dusty Rhodes in those days? Oh yes, Dusty and I had lots and lots of fun together. Not just in those days, but all through, uh, up into uh, uh, all the different ter Watts's territory. Especially, we had a lot of fun in Bill Watts's territory. But uh, uh, Dusty was Dusty was the dream. He was great. Love Dusty. And I hear there's like an Andre Dusty story that you might have? Oh, I've got several Andre Dusty stories. Um, uh, one of the first uh, stories that nobody's heard um, is, uh, well, <laughs> that's just Andre. Let me go to the first Andre Dusty story. I, I'm gonna be kind of crude here and tell you the truth because this is actually the real deal. This is what happened. Dusty's even got this in his book. He's got the characters mixed up a little bit and the timing mixed up but this was the real deal so uh, I, I get a call from Bill Watts he says uh, Brian uh, uh, Dusty's coming in and Andre's coming in and they both want to ride with you and um, I know you got the big blue Continental they know that so I had a big baby blue Continental 1972 that I, you know I had in high school and uh, it was still running good, except the air conditioning, I mean, the heater didn't work. And we're in Jackson, Mississippi, and it's January. So I'm thinking, wow, um, what am I going to tell these guys? You know, I got two of the greatest superstars in the world getting ready to ride in my car. Two guys that I really are like my heroes, you know, and I'm not going to have any heater. What do I say? And so we meet at 1 o'clock at the hotel in Jackson. And the sun's shining, it's probably about 40 degrees with no wind. I remember Dusty had a long sleeve West Texas sh uh, State shirt on and, uh, and a t-shirt underneath. Uh, Andre had a white t-shirt with a Y of A up um, and his uh, buttons were unbuttoned. And so I forgot what I had on, but uh, I felt totally warm. So I wasn't really thinking about it that much. And Dusty goes to me, he goes, hey, beep. I said, yes, sir. Mr. Uh, yes, sir, Dusty, and uh, your dream, whatever, um, trying to be as respectful as I could. And he said, uh, listen, um, I need you to go to the liquor stall. I said, okay. And uh, he said, listen, um, the giant, giant drinks a lot. You need to get him uh, two bottles of Crown Royal. Get him the big ones. I said, yes, sir. He says, get him a case of Budweiser. And he said, get me a case of Lone Star. And uh, you drive and you can have a six pack. I said, okay, thank you, sir. So he hands me a few hundred dollars, uh, and he keeps talking to me. He says, don't forget a cooler. Get a cooler. And he said, get a little cooler. It might be cold. We may have to pee in a cooler. And he said, uh, I got a McDonald's cup uh, in my room. I just bring the cup um, and whatever. And I'm listening to all this, these things he's throwing at me, but I didn't want to forget. I'm what, hoping he's not pissing in the cooler with the beer still in it. What, what liquor What <laughs> liquor to get? Uh, so I got all the liquor, get, loaded it all up, did everything like clockwork. We're leaving at 3 o'clock. It's 220 miles north to uh, uh, Jackson, uh, I mean from Jackson to Greenville, Mississippi, 220 miles north. So we take off. It's cold. It's getting colder. And i am got my defroster on. My defroster works. And so the window is clear, and I'm just listening to these guys. And it's, it's great to be a fly on the wall in the car with the American Dream and Dusty Rhodes. I mean, how much better does it get than that? So I'm listening like crazy, and they're, they're laughing, so I'm laughing, and it's a lot of fun, and it's getting a little colder, and I'm waiting for them to tell me to turn the heater on, and they haven't said anything yet. 
Dusty's already drinking a half a case of beer. Uh, Andre's drinking a half a case of beer and a bottle of Crown Royal. And we're not quite at the building, not quite at the building yet. And uh, we finally get to the building and as their, their stories were so interesting, the weather changed so dynamically on the way up there. By the time we got there, there, were, there was snow on the ground. I mean, it, it dropped below zero, so there was no more snowing. It was just ice, it was cold. And uh, Dusty says, hey, Beat, he says, listen, uh, uh, make sure that car's hot. We, we're not gonna take a shower tonight, because one last, we're just gonna head out of here, and we're gonna hit the road. I said, yes, sir, I'll be ready. So I was on uh, like second, and uh, second or third, and I uh, jumped in, took a quick, quick shower, ran back to the car. Um, it started up the car and I'm trying to, I got the defroster on just hoping for any kind of heat and in my body heat just anything please help me because I know they're gonna be freezing so they come out with the tights and everything I, on still dressed and towels around them and <laughs> so they jump in the car and they're laughing sweating uh, give me a beer give me a beer, beer so the dusty's in the back seat you know he's he's riding uh, in the back seat right in the middle and uh I'm, I'm driving and andre's right here if you're looking from the back so dusty's right right in the middle and he, him and the giant are talking what do you think about that I'm, I'm listening i'm listening you know and everybody's now they're starting to pee we're about 50 miles down the road that cooler's starting to f fill up with pee uh, i had about i don't know three four beers so finally i peed uh, in the mcdonald's cup and we just pass around this small cooler <laughs> and so and then, then, the, then the giant peed in the cup and he, he how uh, could the giant pee in just a cup without I, overflowing <laughs> he was a big cup but yeah. he did and uh so he pees in the cup and uh they're throwing beer bottles out the road and uh, a crown royal bottle that, you know he i know that there was only this much left in the second crown royal bottle that andre had and we're 50 miles still from uh, Jackson, Mississippi on the way home. And he's going, God damn people, it's cold in here. And I said, I oh, know, no, I got the heat on the best I can. I don't know why it's not working so good. And Andre's going, whoa, 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 whoa. He's, he's like so full of alcohol that he can't feel anything, but he's laughing, it makes total sense and it's great. So um, anyway, we're laughing some more and uh, uh, Andre's got to pee again and uh, Dusty grabs the cooler. He's uh, got it on top of his lap and somebody said something that was really, really funny. And all of a sudden Andre goes like this and laughs forward and when he goes backwards, my seat in my Lincoln Continental pops and it falls back on Dusty and that cooler busted wide open on his lap and it's oh it's that got all that hot urine over his whole body <laughs> and he's he cuts the world's worst promo on me or the best promo I mean he was calling me everything but a, but a man I mean he was calling me all kinds of names and god damn people you're blackballed you'll never work again you just embarrassed the dream in front of the greatest superstar the two greatest superstars in the wrestling industry Andre the Giant and watched you piss all over me. I can't believe you did that, people. I said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And Andre's laughing so hard. So, you know, we get back and Dusty's mad at me for the next uh, a few days. And uh, we wind up uh, on that tour. Uh, a few days later, we're in uh, New Orleans. And we have a day off because we're wrestling in the Superdome the following day. So they want to go to Felix's and eat some oysters and go goof off on Bourbon Street. So we do that and we, we ate a lot of oysters and drank a lot of beer at Felix's that day. And uh, the boss, Andre, sees these legs coming out from uh, this place on Bourbon Street. I'm sure a lot of your viewers know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, I guess, a girly bar. And when you go in there, there's a platform, there's a stairs, and then there's a platform like this, and then there's another platform, like a blind platform that you can't see. And you can hear some noise up here as we open the door and start up the plat start up the stairs i notice on the platform that there's like a big palm tree and there's nothing else there just like a fake palm tree and um just as uh kind of following the giant and i'm in the back dusty's right behind the giant and uh the giant gets gets up to the platform he's waiting on dusty dusty gets there i get there the giant's getting ready to take a step to go up the next stairs and all of a sudden the lights go out it's completely black i mean it is so dark you could not see anything at all nothing 
And anyway, uh, it's it's dark and time keeps going by, time keeps going by, and I'm going, gosh darn, and under, he's going, hold onto your poke, hold onto your poke. So, you know, he's telling him, he thinks we're going to get robbed or something. So, uh, apparently there was an electrical outage or something, but while I'm on that platform, I'm thinking, gosh darn, man, I really, I, I can't hold it anymore. I got to pee, and I grab that palm tree, and I turn around, and so I pee in the palm tree. Figure nobody's going to know what the heck, lights went out. I didn't want to pee my pants. So uh, maybe uh, as soon as I was done, maybe one second after I'm done, I had the lights pop on and I hear the Giants going, shit, damn, damn, what happened? The dream's going, damn, what is it? And Andre and I look down and he's got his uh, jeans on and his uh, rolled up cowboy shirt and his cowboy hat and everything, and cowboy boots, cowboy boots inside of his jean. Well, his whole leg's completely wet. And what I thought was the palm tree was Dusty Rhodes' leg. And so I was peeing the whole time on Dusty's leg. And he's going, <laughs> God damn, God damn. And he pulls his boot on and picks his boot up and he dumps a whole bunch of pee out of his boot. And everybody's laughing. He's going, God damn, people. I can't believe you just pissed on the American dream again. That's two times. You'll definitely blackballed. You'll never work again. I promise you'll never work again. And that was so funny. I mean, Andre, I, to, to watch Andre laugh is just such a joy to me. And he laughed so hard when we were together uh, on those trips. He just laughed and laughed. I mean, it was hilarious. But <laughs> Dusty wasn't too happy with, with, with that. <laughs> he, but, I, but he liked it enough to put it in his book. And I guess uh, after Florida, you went to Central States where you were roommates with Jesse Ventura. Do you have any stories about him? Oh, wow, Jesse. Well, we used to travel all the time together, uh, again, uh, breaking kayfabe. And uh, riding with Jesse, you had to be a good listener um, because Jesse would always do a dip and he'd rock. And he'd sit and he'd rock. And I'd drive, I'd listen and listen. And we evolved into political speak. And uh, start talking about various political things and I'd again be a good listener maybe speak 10% of the time and uh, Jesse had what I thought were some kind of radical ideas about politics then but he was uh, he became the governor as you know and um, it was a lot of fun but my favorite story was with Jesse since they always pushed the old guys in Kansas City area they gave Jesse and I a break and um, uh, Jesse was just a heck of a talker. He really was. And uh, here we are, two young uh, guys, and he could talk the talk. And um, I was learning how to work finally and um, catch it on. I had been the Central States Tag Team uh, title holder with Bob, uh, with um, uh, Bulldog Bob Brown. And um, so we sell the house out completely. We are the main event, and the house is completely packed, sold out. First time they had sold out Kansas City in over a year. So Harley Race is there, Bob Goggles there, Pat O'Connor's there, and they're all thrilled. I mean, they're absolutely elated that, you know, because that, they're the partners in the promotion. So they're elated and uh, we're waiting and they never give us a finish. So Jesse said, uh, just at the start, you know, um, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't do anything, let me, let me, when you jump in the ring, I'm gonna beg off for a minute. Um, um, I'm gonna spit at you and uh, just chase me, on, chase me around the ring, uh, jump in and somehow uh, we did a spot off of that. And when he finally begged off in the ring, I mean the crowd erupted. They erupted. And um, every time I hit him, it was like boom, boom, boom. Well, I just kept beating him up because the people were buying it, so they wanted me to kill the guy. So we chased him around the ring, run his head into whatever I could find. I mean, we were brawling, just brawling, and the fans were going crazy. And finally, Jesse just ran, and I followed him behind the stage, you know, like I was chasing him. And uh, we get back there, we thought we, was, we thought we did a great job. <laughs> Looking back, we didn't, because he never stopped me to get the heat and they never gave us a finish so we could have a return match. They were excited about counting those dollars. So Jesse and I were, uh, were kind of uh, elated about the house, but boy, what a butt chewing we got from the three of those guys. And then they started yelling at each other saying, you were supposed to give them the finish. Well, you were supposed to give them the finish. So now Harley and um, uh, Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor are all, they're arguing. And so Jesse and I, uh, 
uh, we uh, kind of ease off into our own place. But um, it was a great experience with Jesse. Um, uh, the guy was a, a great worker, uh, a great talker. He wasn't the best worker, but he was a great talker. Did you ever get to see Harley in action over the years outside the ring in one of his uh, bar room altercations? Or yeah, I saw him knock a guy out at the, in the Imperial Room Lounge in Tampa when I was still training. Um, I hadn't even, uh, um, they hadn't even smartened me up yet. I was still being stretched and all that stuff. And he hit this guy one time and KO'd him, just knocked him out. I don't know what it was about. I just saw Harley hit him and the guy went down, boom. Tough guy. He just had incredible hand strength, I guess. Yes, he had a punch like uh, no tomorrow. And when you were working for Leroy McGurk, some point there, I guess you uh, became lovers with uh, Mike McGurk, who a lot of people remember <laughs> sure. as the ring announcer for WWE. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you were married Kathleen. eventually. Yeah. yeah, we were married for a year. We got married too young. She was very jealous. Um, you know, we're still friends. You know, I, I like Mike. She's a, she's a wonderful woman. And... Um, um, you know, it was just kind of uh, getting married too young. And as a matter of fact, um, I remember the night I was leaving. We were, had gotten a divorce and I was going to the Von Erichs that night. But I wanted to say goodbye to Mike, you know, because she had been my wife for a year. And it was, it's difficult, you know, no matter what, no matter how heated things get, if you really love somebody or love somebody, and then all of a sudden you're separating or getting a divorce because of irrecon irreconcilable differences, you know, it's, uh, it's tough, uh, um, and, um, you know, I had been uh, uh, letting Doug Summers, who I was working against at the time, ride in uh, my car, and Mike would come with us once in a while because she collected tickets for her dad and her mom, um, who owned the promotion, and um, found out uh, later that uh, he was having an affair with my wife. And, you know, that was very hurtful. So one night in Tulsa, it, it came to the point where I saw him go into Leroy's office. So I came into Leroy's office and obviously I was peed, very peed. And uh, one thing led to another and um, uh, we got into it. Just a cuffs, boom, boom, boom. I beat him to within an inch of his life, as a matter of fact, and in the process, Tore, I threw him into the walls, not thinking, you know, again, young and dumb. Uh, threw him into Leroy's walls with all these old time pictures and stuff. And even though Leroy was blind, you know, he was, uh, when he find, found out about this, he was really, really perturbed. And I didn't know about all this until, uh, until later when I go to see Mike uh, after I got in the altercation with Doug. And so I knock on the door and Leroy comes to the door and he says, who is it? And I said, it's, it's Brian, I just wanted to say goodbye to Mike. He said, you bastard, you tore my house. And so when he said that, I just went back to the car. He started doing a promo on me and I went back to the car. The only thing I have after putting $100,000 down a house, and, uh, the, the only thing I wind up leaving with is my car, um, one of our Great Danes, because we raised some Great Danes, and um, um, my boat and uh, my clothes and five hundred dollars. That's all I had. And um, excited about getting to the Von Erichs, but thinking about it, I said I got to say goodbye to Mike one more time. So I uh, knock on the door again. This time, the door opens, and as the door opens, Leroy has a gun pointed right where I'm standing, but the door's not quite open. The second door's not open, the screen door. So now he's opening up the screen door. So I, there's a, like an inlet, you know, like an inlet to the door. And so I jump around the corner because it's a brick house and I figure I'll be safe behind these bricks and he's not gonna see me. And bam, that gun goes off. I mean, he wanted to shoot me, he was that mad. And he just misses, I could see where the bullet hits right in the ground in front of his uh, Lincoln Continental that he parked right in front <laughs> of the doorway so he could get to it real easy. And I run back to the car shaking like crazy, you know, I almost got killed and so I said, dang, what am I gonna do? So I go around to the back door to peek in to see if I could maybe signal to Mike or something to say hello and I look and there's like a mummy on the couch 
uh, just uh, you can't see who it is. It's a mummy, and I see Mike, Michael Kathleen giving soup, and it's Doug Summers, who by that time had gotten out of the hospital and was all wrapped up, bandaged up, and she's uh, feeding him soup, and it just broke my heart. I mean, I, I just cried, Devin, for so so long. Like seemed like I cried all the way to Dallas, uh, Lake Dallas. But uh, when I got there. Uh, uh, David Von Erich had a surprise waiting on me, and uh, it was it was a great surprise. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, what an adventure living with the Von Erichs for a year and a half. And that's a good segue into that. I was going to ask you about that next, actually, because of <laughs> course everybody knows about uh, the reputation of the Von Erich boys. Yeah, we were we were all kind of bad boys. Of course, um, I got more corrupted there. I guess uh, you know, it was like my whole life of of straightness was kind of succumbing to this party stage and life. And um, I, I just had, you know, Fritz and Doris were like family to me. And um, this is a great story. And when I see Kevin in Hawaii, I'll see him again this summer. We'll be, he's got a beautiful place in uh, Kauai. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, Thirty-one acres, ten acres of wetland right across from the beach and it's it has everything on it's just absolutely breathtaking and um his wife pam his two sons um uh marshall and uh, uh ross uh their wives everybody's got um the gardener the groundkeeper there's a whole bunch of houses and um uh, he's he's made it really good, but back back to Lake Dallas with the Von Erichs. The first after this great night of, of you know, uh, Kev, David finds this pretty good looking girl, and uh, she meets me at the door and just grabs me and kisses me, and so that was a surprise. I'll leave it there. And um, so that night uh, we finally go to sleep. The next morning I hear, baby, baby. Get up! I said, "What?" I see David in his robe and his underwear, and he's got a big uh, magnum like a dirty hairy gun, and he's running across the door, and he sees a cat. Bam, bam, bam! So you know, I, I, I don't like him. I didn't want him to shoot the cat because I hate cats. Comes back and he says, "I hate cats," and um, that's how my first day at the Von Erichs was, and. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was crazy. I mean, Doris, the mom, was was a saint, an angel. She really got me to, I mean, really helped me with um, um, my life, um, getting over the divorce, getting into uh, to God and having faith, and uh, just treated me like a real son. And Fritz treated me like a son as well. He put a hundred dollar bill in my check every week and asked me to watch the boys. I said, great. He says, listen, Brian, I want you, I know you got a great reputation, and uh, I'm kind of worried about uh, David and Kevin and Carrie, and I, I really uh, uh, want you to kind of keep an eye on them for me, if you will. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, you know, whatever I can, I'll certainly keep an eye on them, two eyes. And um, so I, uh, we decide together that, you know, uh, we want to take a stab at growing some marijuana. So, so we uh, clear out this patch. You gotta understand, they're on like hundreds and hundreds of acres, and there's uh, Kevin's house, and then uh, Terry's house, and then uh, David's house, and then the big house where uh, Chris and Mike were still at. And um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they're far away, pretty far, you know, you could ride the horse there. And uh, I get the bush hog, and till up the soil and we all get together, four of us are working on this marijuana field and we have no clue really what we're doing, we're reading out of a book. So, because uh, I, I forget some, one of the, I, I can't remember if it was Al Madrill or who it was, they were talking about pounds of pot in the locker room or something, how much the pounds of pot were and so, um, one of the boys get this get rich quick scheme and uh, so I'm all in and um, you know, I've been reading this book on, I, I used to do a lot of gardening and stuff with my grandfather in Arkansas, a lot of farming, and we'd always go in the garden. So I knew a little bit about growing things. And before we know it, the, we have this, these pot plants and 
which is called a sativa. There's an indigo and a sativa pot plant. And we had the sativa pot plants, which can get to be 12, 14 feet high. Well, they're about at least eight, nine feet tall. And the David, I remember David, Carrie and I put our, our arms, it took all of us to get our arms around one of these plants. And now here's about a hundred plants of these things. I mean, a lot. So reading in the book, it says, uh, you know, don't water them for a few days before you're going to harvest them. Um, I guess it makes the THC go to the buds or something like that. And uh, well, um, uh, <laughs> Kevin leaves, we had three hoses, 100 foot hoses hooked together. And uh, there we had a, uh, a layer of corn around the outside of the pot plants. And so, uh, uh, <laughs> Kevin leaves his hose down there and he's not even supposed to water and why he leaves the hose I don't know we're, we're just all thinking about well we're gonna get rich uh, Alma drills gonna get rid of this and, but boom we're gonna have some money finally and uh, you know and it was all in innocence you know it was trying to hurt anybody or do anything wrong but uh, and it is legal in Canada now so the yeah it's legal in Canada, in Canada. It's, it'll be legal everywhere pretty soon but so um, <laughs> and uh, it's legal in Florida too, uh, just not to smoke, but that's about to be changed. So um, um, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the phone rings at the house, and I hear, uh, and David says, "Yeah, Dad, what's wrong? What did I do?" Okay, he hangs up the phone. And he says, "Brian, I got to go to my dad's house. There's something wrong." I said, "What's wrong?" He said, "I don't know, but he wants to see me." I said, well, okay. So David comes back and he's like a, a pale white almost color. And he said, oh, you're not going to believe what I've just been through. I said, what you been through? He said, well, Brock went to the garden. Kevin left the hose. Brock's, Brock's the guy, the gardener, or the farm guy that takes care of the property. And Brock found the uh, pot field and um, took a piece to Fritz. They both went to the Denton Library, got a, a, a encyclopedia or a book that had marijuana in it they compared it they looked and they saw that it was marijuana so they called David over and they explained how Brock found the hose leading to the marijuana and was it your marijuana and David said no it wasn't his he didn't know how it got there and uh, so no, nobody fesses up and um, Brock takes the bush hog and mows down every one of those plants to the nth degree there was nothing left and um, that was uh, very disappointing for all of us at the time so uh um, but quite the experience, I will say. It's too bad he, they just couldn't have paid off the gardener to uh, take care of it and cut him in on... Yeah, the, <laughs> the gardener was too loyal to Fritz. You know, we never thought he was going to... That was the last thing we ever thought would happen. So. And a few years ago, I covered uh, when you gave an award to Haku at one of your legends of wrestling lunches in yeah, Tampa. Yeah, he did a great job, too. Um, do you have any stories of, of him in action? Because I know you're pretty good friends with him. Yeah, we're very good friends. Um, well, I was in a bar one night in Virginia when, uh, I think it was Virginia, West Virginia, when uh, some people were messing with Haku on the other side of the bar. Now that he's a heel and we're baby faces, so we're still k, k Faven. And a fight breaks out, and I see bodies flying everywhere. Boom, boom. Man, and the Haku in action was unbelievable. I tell you, the greatest fight that I could ever imagine in those uh, golden days would have been Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, who I watched annihilate uh, Tony Atlas, bit his ear off. I saw. You see, Tony gave us a different version of that story. Um, than your version, so I'll ask you about that after. I, I was there, I know the version. You asked Tommy Rich the version. He was there too. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, they went together like two bulls. I'll just tell you right now, they went together, well, no, nah, it's a better story if I tell it. So, um, where was I at? Uh, you were it's talking about Haku, if oh, Haku, Haku were to fight. Yeah, if Haku, uh, Haku fought Orndorff, that would have been a tremendous fight because Paul was, uh, I never saw Paul lose a fight and I saw him beat up a lot of people. He beat up Van Vader. I wasn't there, but he beat up Van Vader. Uh, and I talked to, I was in uh, helping Rock, The Rock, with his first match in Nassau in the Bahamas. And Rocky was there. Rocky uh, 
who was always at Legends Lunch. I just talked yeah. about him. We um, interviewed Rocky that year, and he actually told us about that match in the Bahamas with his son. Yeah, yeah, yeah they tagged together, and uh, that was a very proud moment. But the two kids that were going to be in the handicap match with Leon, when, when Paul came in and said, uh, Leon, you've got to get, uh, Eric wants you uh, in two minutes, he said, tell Eric he's going to have to wait, because uh, he didn't have his boots even laced up yet. So Paul comes back in, according, I'm listening to these two guy, kids that are sitting there trembling to death, knowing that they got to work with Big Van Vader and how he's notorious for <laughs> taking guys' heads off. Oh, you were with WCW at the time? No, 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 no. I, I was with, uh, I was in an independent show with Hal Jeffrey, uh, was a promoter, and we were in Nassau. Oh, But okay. these two kids were working on the show because they floated around and you know, oh, went, I see. went from territory to territory, basically jobber guys, and uh, but good guys and... Um, um, you know, everybody plays an important role. I don't like the word enhancement talent or anything like that. I, they were wrestlers. And uh, they, they're telling me the story, blow by blow, since they were right there. And so Paul uh, uh, comes back in and said, Eric said, if you're not there in another minute, that you can pack your bags. He said, uh, Eric, tell Eric to go F himself, blah, blah, blah. And one thing escalated into another. And um, according to these two eyewitnesses, Leon hit Paul who just had flip-flops on, uh, a tank top, almost the identical outfit he had when he was fighting um, Tony Atlas, uh, per their description, and uh, knocked him over some boxes. And when Leon went to jump on Paul from there, Paul left hooked him, uh, which reminds me of Danny Spivey hitting uh, Yeah, which we will Adrian ask Adonis. you about. Um, and, uh, 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 Paul beat the, beat the crap out of him, according to not just these two guys, but many, many people who were there afterwards. And this is years later. So uh, Paul Orndorff was a bad son of a gun. Yeah, and that was after his arm injury. Too, that was right? after his arm injury when uh, Hogan hit, hit him in the cap center in the chin. Now, what Atlas said to us was he was eating fried chicken in the back seat and... Paul was telling him he hated the smell of fried chicken, and that's how the argument started. He said that when they got out of the car, he leg dived Paul, took Paul down, put him in a cradle, <laughs> and his ear was near Paul's mouth, and Paul bit him when he was in the cradle, and that broke up the fight. First off, his. first off, you asked Tommy Rich or Paul Orndorff. There was no chicken in the car. This is what started it. That night in Wheeling, West Virginia, um, Tony Atlas was screaming and nobody wanted to be around him because he found out that he had to do a job. And he's slamming locker room doors. He's saying, nobody can kick my ass, but maybe Andre the Giant. And I doubt that could even happen. And he's slamming doors, locker room doors. And he says, now I got to do a, a job for Dino Bravo. I can't lace my boots up or whatever. And going on and on. And um, um, I, I, I don't know if it was Dino Bravo, but he had to do a job for whoever he says. And uh, a couple of minutes later, it's kind of quiet, and I go around, and I was going to say something to Tony, because I like Tony. And I look, and he's got two syringes, three cc syringes, one in each ass cheek, just trying to, like, show off. Um, so he's taking six cc's of, three cc's of DECA and three cc's of test. He also told us he only ever took one D-ball a day. Ah, oh, gosh. <laughs> what a line, dog. Oh, gosh. Anyway, um... um that's, that's the truth. And so on the way back home from Wheeling, West Virginia, um, back to Atlanta, we're in the car and Paul's behind in the back seat uh, of this rent -a car. Uh, Tommy Rich is behind me, I'm driving, and Tony's in the passenger seat. Well, Paul says, hey Murdoch, can you move your uh, seat up? You're crunching my legs. And there's another story where that comes from. And all of a sudden, uh, Tony says, don't call me Murdoch. That redneck, ba 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 ba. He went off on it. He said, "Don't you ever call me that, or I'll kick your ass." Paul said, "You ain't gonna kick my ass." He says, "Bullshit, uh, Brian. You pull the car over and uh, let me uh, show your boy who's the man." And all of a sudden, Tommy's well, "Guys, guys, you know, please, please don't fight." He said, "Start almost ready to cry." Um, and uh, I said, "No, you guys just straighten it out, man. Just." Be cool and let's get to Atlanta, I'm tired. And Paul says to me, beep, if you don't pull over, I'm gonna beat your ass. And I said, okay, I'll look and find a place. So 
I didn't want to fight Paul. So, um, and he wouldn't have fought me anyway. He's too good of a friend, but he was mad. And, um, and Atlas was mad. He was just mad the whole night. He was angry. There was no chicken in the car, none at all. Just that comment about Murdoch that just hit Tony the wrong way. And because um, um, Murdoch was kind of a redneck, prejudiced guy, and everybody knew that. So, um, you know, Paul wasn't thinking when he said that, and he didn't mean anything bad by it. It was just that when we went into Louisiana, Paul and I, the f first time, uh, Killer Carl Cox and Dick Murdoch, would, whichever one was driving, would pull that bench seat. They were sharing a car, they had a bench seat, and uh, like a big Buick, and they would push it all the way back for these 300 mile trips, and so Orndorff and I would have to sit knee to knee in the back seat, and since they were green, you know, what are we gonna do with Murdoch and Carl Cox, you know, two big superstars, and, um, you know, much, we, respect, we respected our veterans and um, of the business. So that's where that, came from, uh, just so the audience knows. And um, then uh, um, I see this bowling alley and there's a, like, a, it says bowling and I look to the right, there's like a, uh, there's grass, there's a asphalt, there's uh, trailers without the uh, semis on them, uh, parked up by this, um, uh, looks like a basketball court. So I said, that looks like a good place. You guys could either fight on the grass or you can fight. Hey, and Tommy's going, trying to interrupt me. No, 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 don't encourage it. And, and he's going on and on. And it's, 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 Tommy was the funniest thing about the whole thing. And so Tony walks all the way to the asphalt. This is at night, but it's lit. It's got lights. And uh, we start walking and t Tommy's saying, no, guys, please don't fight. Guys, please don't fight. All of a sudden, they converge on each other like two bulls. Um, Paul winds up going behind him and bellies to, belly to back him. And they roll on the, make about two turns on the concrete. And I can't see Paul's head and I can't see Tony's head. And all of a sudden, I hear, ah, you cheated. Ah, you cheated. And Paul goes, Phew. and an ear, the whole bottom lobe of his ear shoots off. Now Tommy Rich goes, starts screaming, oh my God, it's an ear, oh my God, he bit his ear off and he's crying and he goes and he grabs, it's his ear, it's his ear. So Tommy's crying. <laughs> so uh, uh, Paul uh, got off of him because Tony says, I, you know, he gave, he said, my ear's bit off, I quit, I quit, I quit. And uh, you cheated, you son of a gun. And they went lipped off a little bit, but uh, Tony didn't lip off to him that much. Paul was doing more of the lipping to him. And, uh, he, and he asked me to hold his crucifix when he got out. He had a gold crucifix and he gave it to me and he had a white uh, cut off tank top and uh, a red pair of University of Spartans uh, football gym pants and a pair of white tennis shoes and white socks. Very tan, i never forget. And um, you know, when after uh, Tommy Rich picked up that ear, he was literally bawling, I mean, crying hard. And we all get back in the car, um, and um, we take Tony to the hospital. Well, on the way there, Tony, man, we better get out again and do it. And Paul says, let's pull over, we'll, we'll do it again. Oh, just take me to the hospital, he says. So we get him to the hospital. This is in the, in the Atlanta Territory. We, uh, we take him to the hospital. They said he's got to stay overnight. So we went back to Atlanta. We left Tony there, and he never came back to the Territory. And the next time we saw each other was in New York. That's the gospel story. And you were starting to mention the Spivey Adonis story. He gave us... Uh, a brief version, um, what's the witness version of what happened? Well, this is what happened. Uh, I was in the back talking to uh, a bunch of the guys, um, and Spivey and Adonis are working, and I know that they had had some friction in the past, and I wanted to get out and watch the match. Jimmy was already out there. So um, I don't know what I'm, I'm talking to some of the guys, and um, I don't know if Tito Santana was there. Um, this is in Flint, Michigan, by the way. and. Uh, all of a sudden, Brunzi comes running in and he says, they're shooting, they're shooting. I said, what? So as I go to run out to see this shoot, in comes uh, Spivey. I said, Danny, what's wrong? He's going, that motherfucker, God, God dang, that son of a bitch. And he's cussing, his, I mean, he's cussing like crazy uh, about Adrian. He says he tried to, he tried to uh, 
put me out with the sleeper. And Brunzi said, yeah, he, he did. He, I saw he looked stiff. He said, stiff. He was totally trying to put me out. If I, if I wouldn't have got to the ropes there, I, was, I, I would have been laying in the ring, a sound asleep. And uh, so he shot with the sleeper on him. And uh, Spivey was able to get out of it. Um, and, um, you know, Adrian was a, uh, was, a state champion, was a state champion wrestler, and he was, I heard, could people be People were t- afraid of him, Danny said. Yeah, pe- like, people were afraid of Adrian, because he was crazy. He was like a little bit loony tick. He said he was also, he didn't say how, but he said he was very, like, grotesque in some ways. Did you ever notice that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a lot of dirt under his fingernails and some of the things like that, you know. He uh, ate it, massive, well, obviously he gained like 100 pounds in a year yeah, or so. Yeah, he kind of did that for his gimmick, and... Um, they wanted to be a fat gay guy, and um, that's, I guess that was Pat Patterson's creation, and he wore the pink tights and all that. But um, uh, anyway, uh, in comes Spivey, going, hey, what the, ba da 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 Spivey, I mean, Danny's standing up now, he's got his yellow tights on, he, stand, he, he sat down for a second, and he's got his head, and he's kind of just cussing, God, I can't believe he did that, and then walks Adrian, Adrian, that was the worst mistake he ever made. Um, and he was going like this to the Spivey and he's cussing at him. All of, all of a sudden he, he goes to leg dive him. And as he goes to leg dive Danny, Danny left hooks him. And you ask anybody, Jimmy, anybody there, it sounded like a shotgun hit a watermelon. When he hit, when he hit um, Adrian's face, his whole cheekbone was sticking out, the whole meat from his face. Uh, had just popped up and his cheekbone sticking out. Well, then Spivey kind of, he, he goes down. I mean, uh, Adrian goes down and Danny's cussing at him and Adrian gets back up and he goes to swing at him and Spivey nailed him about three, four more times and boom, that was it. I mean, Adrian never got a punch in and he was down and his face looked like a uh, just a broken up piece of, uh, watermelon or it was all it was gross very gross and you were friends with Hogan uh, is it true that they were actually building up Adrian to face Hogan prior to that um, I don't know that they were actually building Adrian uh, for Hogan because Adrian wound up teaming up the two odd oddest couple uh, Adrian and Murdoch became a, a very, very good heel tag team. So I, I, I'm not sure if uh, they were building them up. Um, um, that I didn't, I don't really, I'm not privy to that knowledge. Do you have any stories about Randy Savage? Oh, Randy was a great guy, you know, no particular funny, well, one when uh, we were in Lake Placid, New York, and the doctor walked in, uh, because he does the physicals. You have to have one in New York. Um, and uh, he wasn't in the locker room, and the doctor walked in, and Liz was in there, and I guess she was changing or something. Randy walked in, and he snatched the doctor and picked the doctor up, up against the wall by his, with his coat and his stethoscope and all that. Then he slaps him slaps him a couple of times and throws him out of the locker room. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't too cool. So Randy had a temper when, it was around, when he was around uh, uh, Liz a little bit, and he was very tight at the time. I remember when we were in Newark, New Jersey, and we had got there about three in the morning, and he refused to check into the hotel. So him and Liz stayed in the lobby to check in the next day at the right time. They just stayed in the lobby, and here we were all making a lot less money than Macho Man was. And, we all bought a room, but um, and then uh, Liz was get there when they first came up to New York. Um, he didn't have a coat, so Liz wanted to buy him a coat. But his birthday was uh, it's in the winter time, I guess, because um, he was waiting either for Christmas or his birthday um, for Liz to buy the coat. So he froze for three weeks <laughs> before he let Liz buy him this coat. And um, so Randy was a uh, was famous for being tight. Um, he was also uh, a great guy to work with, tremendous guy to work with. Every time we'd have, he'd say, okay, don't shoot with me, don't shoot with me, you know, that deep voice, don't shoot with me, don't shoot with me. Uh, I said, okay, okay, because I, I like to wrestle a lot, you know, to start my matches. It says wrestling on the marquee, so I like to wrestle a little bit and then get into the things. So, um, uh, 
you know, just the fact that Randy was a, a class act, uh, one of the one of the really best hearts in the business. If he liked you, Randy liked you. If he didn't like you, he didn't like you, and he would certainly let you know. He didn't pull any punches. And I understand you have a Coco Beware story. Oh, uh, yeah. If you, um, um, everybody likes Andre, so um, we were in um, Bill Watts's territory, and. Um, uh, Bill asked me to get a van for Andre because all, uh, for some reason Andre liked to hang around with me and I, I loved him hanging around. <laughs> I loved to hang around with him and we always had a good time together. And so we got, I got the van and Andre was originally supposed to sit in the front seat, but he wanted to sit the way this van was. It had like a back, you remember those vans, like conversion vans they called them? Yeah. They had the seats and everything in the back. So he sat in the back there with... Um, J.J. Dillon, uh, Terry Garvin, and um, I don't know if there was anybody else. Coco was, uh, yeah, I think it was just J.J., Terry, and the giant in the back. Coco was in the front seat, and I'm driving. And um, we're heading back to Tulsa. I forget where we're, we're coming from, and um, we're on the interstate. I'm driving along, and everybody's drinking you know it's just the way it was and everybody drank and drove even the driver you know i even i was even having a few beers um i never drove drunk uh thank god but um i still had some beers which it was part of being a wrestler in those days you wouldn't be considered no you cool, wouldn't you wouldn't be considered one of the boys if you yeah. didn't drink beer on the road so that, you're right Devin. and um so all of a sudden i hear some whispering blah, 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 and, um, you know terry's bisexual so Coco's laughing, you know, and jamming, and um, got the radio on, and having a good time. I always had fun with Coco, and he, if you talk to Coco, he could tell you the story. All of a sudden, the boss says, Coco, he says, yeah, boss. He said, come here, I want to tell you something. Right away, Coco turns around, yeah, boss. He goes, come here. So Coco bends over like this, yeah, boss. The, Andre snatches him in a front face lock. Got him right in the front face like he says, hey, boss, what are you doing? Hey, loosen up, boss, loosen up. I hear him, loosen up, loosen up. Coco was saying, loosen up, loosen up. Well, he turns his ass backwards. Now I'm looking in the rear view mirror, and there's Terry Garvin with his pants down. And I can see in the rear view mirror, and, and JJ's laughing his ass off. And uh, now he's cutting, uh, Terry's cutting a promo on uh, Coco saying, oh man, I love that dark meat, and boy, I'm just gonna get some tonight. And the boss is going, ah, ha, ha, ha. he's just laughing, oh, ha, ha. and uh, everybody's laughing. Now, I'm not, I don't think this is funny at all. Now. I'm driving, and I'm thinking, boy, I'm gonna get in trouble. Now, all of a sudden, I look, and Terry's got an erection, and he's slapping the back of Coco's, uh, he's got his, uh, I hear the, I hear his pants go, and when I heard his pants go rip wide open and Coco screaming now for bloody murder, uh, and I see him tapping his thing on the back of Coco's back, he's going, ah, oh, I got it, and he's talking smack to him, you know, really bad, nasty stuff, and, you know, I, I didn't know what to do, and I hit the brakes, and I to pull over, and I hear Coco go, ah! And uh, I don't know what happened. No idea what happened. And all of a sudden, I, I get the car over, and Coco jumps out of the car, and he starts running. And I said, what the hell are you doing, Terry? God dang it, man. That's crazy. You can't rape somebody in a freaking car. He goes, I didn't touch him. I didn't touch him. It was a joke. And JJ's laughing. He says, oh, settle down. It's okay. It's okay. And I, I still, I didn't think it was funny at all. And the boss is laughing so hard. I'm not going to say nothing to the boss. But uh, <laughs> I said, i got to figure out a way to get Coco back in the car. Now, he's, he's got his pants ripped <laughs> he's, he's on the interstate and he's yeah, just been yeah. molested <laughs> I'm thinking, ah, by a 240 pound hairy guy you know and uh, i'm thinking oh gosh oh, with gosh, andre what is gonna him. happen what is gonna happen and it took me almost an hour to get coco back in the van wow. finally andre everybody had to come out and console him and tell him nothing was gonna happen and i don't blame coco you know for that because you know that was kind of a, a drunken uh dirty trick but uh, nonetheless, it happened. Now, I think we're definitely going to have to have a part two of this down the road because uh, you gave very detailed answers and we still have a lot of questions. But we can't uh, do a shoot interview with you without asking what the hell the whole Iron Sheik 
he is about and obviously it's squashed now because obviously he's in a wheelchair i've seen you guys together but yeah you know i i've always liked his cheeky baby you know and uh uh he's always funny you know just from times he's fallen out of the ring and getting his his boots with the hook he get the tip of his boots caught in the ring it would be so funny you know he'd love to do that spot and um, the thing about Sheik and Volkov, just while we're on the subject, and I'll tell you, I, you know, they could get such great heat, and especially when Slick was their manager. I mean, they would get such great heat. Um, Nikolai would sing the Russian anthem, and of course the Iranian flag, and you know, the American people weren't gonna put up with that, and uh, they would get the best heat, but it was impossible to make a comeback on them. So you'd, I'd get the hottest tag, boom, the roof would come off. and. Uh, you know, you punch them and they barely re react. So you got to lay them in, and then they get mad for you potatoing them, and you say to well, sell them. You know, and you go to slam them, and your back goes out because you got to shoot with them to totally slam them to give Sheik an ass bump. It's like an act of Congress. You know, it's a, you give Nikolai a clothesline, and it's, it's in three stages. It's down to one knee, and then to his elbow, and then to his back. You know, it's uh, you know, then you got to pick them up when you should never have to pick up a heel. But Sheik used to like to shoot a little bit and um, you know being an amateur wrestler and then learning the art of hooking before hooking was cool jiu-jitsu uh, that's all they taught us you know we'd work out with um, submission wrestling, submission wrestling exactly you know and from Carl Gotch who was a tremendous submission wrestler hero was a tremendous submission wrestler Gordon Nelson you know all these guys Jack Briscoe Bob Backlund all these guys would come down and I work work with them work with them work with them every day in submission um, um, uh, Jody Simon um, uh, started coming down a little bit and some of um, uh, you know because Carl would train Jody constantly they would work out together and so Carl would bring Jody there used to be some heat there but that kind of uh, with Ed, with the Grams and since uh, the Malenko's ran um, what that at that time they called outlaw it was just opposition to the Florida territory so there was some heat there but anyway Jody uh, uh, finally he was always a gentleman still is uh, as well as his brother Dean but um, you know when you start training with these guys days day in and day out and you know you start learning um, that as an amateur wrestler you have to be careful when you're wrestling somebody that knows how to hook because if you like tight waist them you know they're gonna double wrist lock you you know it just every time you grab them somewhere there's there's like a counter in submission so I learned submission and so Sheik used to like to wrestle and shoot a little bit at the beginning you know we'd wrestle do sit-ups we'd grab a shoot hold once in a while and uh, um, you know so we'd tap if it started to hurt you know or something like that you know but uh, Sheik would brag that nobody could outshoot him and in Hershey Pennsylvania he shot on me and um, uh, with a front face lock and I double wrist locked him and um, he, he started he started going, God dang, you son of a bitch, you son of a bitch, ah, let go. And he's tapping my eye, ah, let go, let go. And now uh, Nikolai goes, he's laughing, okay, Shiki, ah, you can't be beat, ah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a picture of this, look, tell, he's telling people to take the picture, look, the Sheik's giving up. And so I think because he got embarrassed in Hershey, um, that he, it just went to his head, you know, his, I don't know, Sheik started drinking and doing so many drugs towards the end there that, he just got, uh, I don't know, just a little weirded out, I guess, but um, that, that bothered him. And after that, you know, he started cutting all these promos on me and I, you know, I knew he was mad at me, kind of, uh, at that point. Um, but I thought it was water under the bridge and he just uh, perpetuated it to, you go to the internet now and they've got all these cartoons uh, with the Sheik and I and, um, it's uh, it's funny, but that's that's what started the whole thing. And now he's really mellow. The last time I saw him, like he's not putting out videos like that anymore, and he has pretty much handlers with him wherever he goes, watching him. From what I from what I see, and you can yeah. shoot on a small child now. Yeah, really, that's too bad, you know, because uh, Sheik was a tremendous athlete. Uh, he used to get uh, he used to get. Um, Paul Orndorff had a bowling alley in Fayetteville, Georgia, and the Sheik lives there. I think he still lives there. Uh, well, I don't know where he lives, actually. That's where him and Carol lived. And Sheik used to go to the bowling alley and uh, get a case of uh, Heineken yeah. and uh, 
have his uh, wrestling trunks on and do uh, jump squats and push-ups and jump squats and push-ups and uh, drink Heineken uh, in Paul's bowling alley parking lot. And some of the bowlers started to complain and uh, Paul had, had to tell Sheik not to go, not to, you know, do that in his bowling alley anymore. And they got a little, Sheik got a little bent out of shape over that. But uh, And I got to ask it, you quickly about Outback Jack because I just remembered that you had something to say about Outback Jack and he's a very popular topic on my channel. Oh gosh, one of my favorite Outback, well, there's several Outback Jack stories, but one of my favorite ones was at the Holiday Inn in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> Outback Jack was his own worst enemy because he used to brag all the time. And uh, he told Fuji that he could out drink him. There's no way that Fuji could out drink him. So they set up a drinking contest at the bar at the Holiday Inn where we were all staying in San Francisco. So Fuji's there, the Bulldogs are there, Outback Jack obviously, uh, Outback and uh, uh, let's see, as the bar went around, um, Outback's kind of here, and Fuji's over here, then the Bulldogs are over here, Brunzel and I are over here, some of the other boys are around, and every time they get a beer, uh, the, one of the Bulldogs would get Outback's attention, and the other one would drop a Halcyon, which is a second <laughs> into Outback's beer. So he doesn't realize he's drinking these Halcyons, and I'm thinking, you know, I told Dynamite, at one time, I said, man, don't kill the guy, please, don't. He said, no, 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 I'm just going to give him five or six. I said, geez, five or six. So, I mean, that's a lot of halcyons with beer and stuff. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, you know, there's so many of those, oh, gosh, moments and on the road that it's unbelievable. And um, uh, come on, Fuji's going, come on, drink up, drink up. Come on, you out drink me. Uh, and they're going back and forth. And all of a sudden, out back goes, falls straight backwards off of his bar chair. Boom. And he doesn't knock him out. He's going, oh, what hit me? He goes, you blokes put something in my beer, didn't you? And Dynamite going, no, 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 we didn't do anything. Uh, come on, mates, I know you did something. Uh, I could drink a lot more than that. And uh, this doesn't feel like me's going on. This doesn't feel like beer. You put something in my drink. And then they're going back and forth. And uh, so Jimmy and I grab out back, and the Bulldogs follow us, and we're taking him to his room and all of a sudden he he just falls down like we can't carry him to his room so the bulldogs and the bees are carrying out back jack to his hotel room and so we get him to the room and um, um, try to set him on the bed and as we set him on the bed he falls off the bed and he starts calling the uh, Davy and Dynamite some names, uh, you know, blaming them about putting the house on. He didn't say house on. You guys put stuff in my drink. I put something in my drink, and all of a sudden, uh, Dynamite just starts peeing right in his face. I mean, peeing a big old stream of pee right in his face. And Outback's going, oh, 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 well, I've been peed on by better blokes than you, mate. <laughs> Timmy and I are kind of laughing, but we're feeling really bad for the guy at the same time. So anyway, uh, we all leave, and uh, Brunzi wants to get something to eat, and it's like one o'clock in the morning. Um, it's late, uh, two o'clock in the morning, and we go get something to eat, and all of a sudden, we a table in there, and out back comes walking into the Holiday Inn restaurant, staggering in, with his cowboy boots on, and his... Uh, his hat, his Australian hat with all the crocodile teeth and not a stitch else on, naked as a jigger, <laughs> right into the restaurant. And there's at least 30 people in there. Uh, and, um, you know, it was a very popular place close to the airport. And uh, he just sits at the counter. It doesn't say anything. And uh, I, the waitress, I can see them, the waitress and them are saying, we can't believe this is happening. So, uh, Outback gets up and he turns around and there, there's like a fake garden in there in the middle and he starts peeing in the garden and all of a sudden some police come walking in and the police take out. <laughs> We're not getting involved. We just sit there and Good thing there's they, no they, cell they just take days. an Outback <laughs> in the squad car. Um, apparently they, they let him go though. Uh, they let Jack go and he didn't, uh, they just laughed, I guess, from what Jack said. They just laughed at me and let me go. Uh, 
but to see a, a grown six foot two, 270 pound man walk into the uh, restaurant at the Holiday Inn in um, San Francisco is quite the sight. <laughs> Now, the next thing I'm going to ask you, I'm also going to make an individual clip, and I'm also streaming this live because I know it's important to you, is about the 2019 Cauliflower Alley Awards. Of course, you're the president of the organization. Do you want to tell us a bit about uh, what your duties are as president and also what we can expect at uh, the 2019 awards and how people can can come and see it. Sure, absolutely, Devin. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I'm so passionate about the Cauliflower Alley Club. When I first went to the Cauliflower Alley Club, I didn't even know what it was. And that's our mission now is to really make the boys more, more aware of what the Cauliflower Alley Club is, what it does, and how much fun you can have there and how much fun it is to be a member of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Uh, I was honored in 2001 with a men's honoree and um, award and it was a big deal i still have it in my awards room hanging on the wall and um when i found out what the cac did i said i'd I, you know i'd i'd like to help them somehow and years went by and uh morgan dollar came up to me at a, a gulf coast wrestling reunion and said um the board wants to know if you would like to be the president of the cac because nick bockwinkle is not doing well and I asked him what it entailed and all that stuff. And, uh, and then I was told you can, the president by the, per the bylaws has the option to be the CEO because I didn't want to use my name. I didn't want to be Brian Blair to be, um, have other people doing things since I've, you know, I've run a $5 billion budget along with six other people as a Hillsborough County commissioner, as an elected commissioner countywide and um, ran, started one Gold's Gym and built them into four Gold's Gyms and sold them for a lot of money. Uh, you know, I know a little bit about business and so um, I didn't want somebody with the ability to mess up my vision for what the CAC was. And they said, you can elect to be the CEO too if you wish, but you have two jobs. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I became the president and CEO. And, um, the Cauliflower Alley Club is a 501c3 nonprofit set up in Coleman, Alabama. Uh, we're about to have our 54th reunion April 29th through May 1st. Some tremendous honorees I'll tell you about in a second. But what the Cauliflower Alley Club does is we give wrestlers that have fallen on difficult financial times or referees, uh, anybody that worked in the wrestling industry full time for three years or more is eligible for assistance. Now, had Brickhouse Brown known about the Cauliflower Alley Club six months earlier, he would be alive today because Rocky Johnson called Brickhouse Brown uh, or somebody called Rocky Johnson and had, knew about the Cauliflower Alley Club. Anyway, I get a hold of Brick, wind up, Rocky asked me if I knew who Brickhouse was. I said, um, I know that he, um, that he uh, uh, broke in in Florida, but he was broken a couple years after I did. And he said, well, he's got cancer and he needs help. So I talked to Brickhouse, yeah, he's got, poor guy's broke, his wife left him, he's in a hundred dollar a week uh, hotel room, has no insurance, uh, no nothing, um, the doctor's only giving him pain medicine. He, has, he had stage two cancer and the doctor gives him pain medicine, no kind of therapy, no kind of treatment, nothing. And Brick had no money, so months are going by before he gets a hold of the Cauliflower Alley Club, the Cauliflower Alley Club sends him to a doctor. Uh, he was so thankful, so humble for that. You know, he said, wow, $500 for the doctor. You know, I couldn't believe it. We did, so we take care of the doctor. And this doctor that he had wasn't the best doctor in the world either because uh, Brick calls me up and says, the doctor wants to cut my testicles off tomorrow. And I said, did you get a second opinion, Brick? I mean, are you sure? He said, no, I, I didn't get a second opinion. Says I, I don't have any more money, and he said. I said, well, I, I asked Bruce Starp to help out, and some other guys. Everybody pulled together and um, did what we do best, and um, we found him another uh, reputable doctor. He went to that doctor. He didn't have to get his testicles cut off. And thank God he didn't listen to that other doctor. But to make a long story short, um, we helped Brick out tremendously with a lot of things. He was very grateful. He finally got on uh, disability, which. Took him like eight months while he's got cancer uh, and got food and 
the things that he needed and uh, a check coming in. So uh, uh, we, we help people when they're um, down in any kind of way, unless they have a drug problem, we don't assist people that uh, have drug problems. Um, and everything's done. Uh, Carl Lauer does an excellent job with our benevolent fund. He makes sure that the money is written out to the, to the business or to the um, entity where the bills are owed, whether it's the, the landlord or whether it's the doctor or whatever the case may be. Some people may just actually need money to pay their simple bills, um, electric, um, basic stuff. Um, and you know we, we help them. There's a benevolent request form if you go to caulifloweralleyclub.org. That's caulifloweralleyclub, one word, dot org. You can see all the things that the CAC does. And we've given away hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, people like Brickhouse, people in, in need. We don't mention people's names unless they specifically tell us to, but people like Bobby the Brain Heenan, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, Kamala. These are names that said we could use their names that they wanted to help. They want people to know that the Cauliflower Club, uh, Cauliflower Alley Club is a great organization. Uh, Jerry Gray, most recently too, who has cancer. Um, the yeah. Cauliflower Alley Club, uh, per its bylaws, has given Jerry the maximum each year for the last three years. So um, that's all I can say. I mean, we'd love to help the world uh, if we could, just like every kind-hearted person would, but we, but we simply can't, but we do help. So many, there are so many wonderful stories of people that were so far down that they were just praying to God for anything good to happen to them. And, um, you know, all of a sudden they find, uh, well, well, go, somebody will tell them, go check out the Cauliflower Alley Club. Well, what's Cauliflower Alley Club? And when they find out what it is and what we do, people that come and come to our reunions, we have the greatest members in the whole world. It's like a a fraternity of friends. I mean, these fans, fan friends, um, become close to the boys. You know, there's probably, there'll be uh, 250, 200, 250 of the guys there, and uh, they have two wrestling shows the night before. Um, and if you want to know what happened at last year's event, uh, search Cauliflower Alley 2018 on the Hannibal TV. We covered the awards, and I think we had about 30 interviews while we were there and it was a great time. So if you're a wrestling fan and you want to support uh, these legends, a lot of them need our help, uh, I highly suggest go into that. Yeah, please, and, that, and that's great, Devin. And we're, uh, we're glad you're gonna be back in 2019 because we're gonna be honoring, um, uh, golly, one of the, a guy who's a, a three-time world champion, um, Mark Henry, will get the Iron Mike Award. Um, He's been a world champion in three different sports. Dory Funk Jr., I mean, Dory, Dory Funk Jr. is a legend. I mean, he's still huge in Japan. They still bring him over to Japan. You know, he's seven, over 70 years old, and they still bring him to Japan, and he jumps in the ring and snaps the rope or whatever. But uh, in his prime, uh, Dory was wonderful to work with. I worked with him lots and lots and lots of times, and he's taught me so much different stuff. The guy could go it. When he was 60 years old, the guy could just go like crazy. He's 65. And, and and um, uh, he'll be there uh, accepting the Luthez Award. Um, two of my favorite people, uh, Barbarian and Haku, will, uh, who were the Islanders and uh, Faces of Fear, Islanders in WWF, WWE, and the Faces of Fear in WCW. Uh, they'll be receiving the Tag Team Award this year. Um, uh, Bambi, uh, many of you may remember Bambi. She'll be receiving a Women's Wrestling Award. We have. Um, many other wonderful, wonderful people. Um, if you go to caulifloweralleyclub.org, you can see the whole slate of honorees there. It's a fabulous slate. Dr. D, Dr. Death. I'll never forget when Dr. D slapped uh, Stossel in the Madison Square Gardens. I was right there. It's, that was a pretty uh, uh, interesting event, I should say. But uh, when you come to the Cauliflower Alley Club, we don't allow mean people or disruptive people. You don't find those kind of people there. We have had to ask a few people not to come back or to leave. Um, but that's in the past. People understand uh, that we're just a, a group of people that get together to have a great time. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, anybody that's going to cause problems, get drunk, be nasty. I mean, you can do what you want as long as you behave. And uh, Vegas has a lot of fun things to do. I think there's, uh, we stay at the Gold Coast Hotel. We have uh, rooms for $43. Plus there's a $12.50 um, 
surcharge that I negotiated down from uh, $25, like all the other uh, resorts are either $25 or $30, their resort fee. Uh, Gold Coast, we got down to $12.50 for our members, $43 rooms. Um, with your, with your uh, reunion tickets, it's all encompassing, it's $125. Uh, it includes all these wonderful seminars that Ron Hutchison has put together. They have some tremendous seminars. Again, go to cauliflowerallyclub.org and you can see what the seminars are. We have uh, bowling tournaments, cribbage tournaments. There is a small fee to enter those, 10 or 15 bucks, I think it is. Uh, Bob Orton Jr. finally won last year after three times and he'll be back to defend his uh, cribbage tournament uh, championship, um, which is a big deal to those that pay, play cribbage. Um, uh, Somebody's trying to uh, dethrone uh, Fred uh, Yerke, who's won the bowling tournament the last couple of years. And uh, we have, um, uh, the members are so innovative. Um, they invented a, a strut contest. And we'll be at, we'll, they go to a bar, um, one of the bars inside of the hotel. And the people are like, maybe spread out for 100 feet. And there's a, a, a gap, there's be probably two, 250 people there and, uh, and people strut, you know, just uh, like the, uh, the strutters, like Ric Flair and uh, uh, Jerry Jarrett, strut. different people. Yeah, so they have a strut off. And then uh, the younger wrestler started this thing called a chop contest. So it's who can take the most chops. So that's entertaining too. Even though the Cauliflower Alley Club doesn't sponsor it, these guys get out and whoever can chop the meat the most. And when you'll, I saw these guys about three years ago. I saw these two guys with their shirts off <laughs> walking through the hotel. One guy had blood coming all from his chest. And I mean, they were really proud of this. I mean, these guys' chests were so welted up. It was unbelievable. So there's so many interesting things to do there. I mean, there's, um, you know, tons of restaurants and Vegas is wide open all night for $125. That includes your whole reunion plus two awesome meals for the honorees nights. We'll have honorees nights on Tuesday and honorees nights on Wednesday. You come watch your uh, favorite, um, some of your favorite uh, wrestlers of the past, um, sometimes many uh, that are still active. Um, uh, lots of the WWE guys come. WWE gets a few tables, and they all they bring a whole bunch of guys: Sergeant Slaughter and Ricky Steamboat, and bunches of guys. Or Pat Patterson. Uh, just RVD even came by last RVD year. RVD was there last year. Yeah, he was a blast. Um, Godfather you know, had a lot of fun with Shawn Michaels. You know, I uh, got to work around Shawn for a long time. Uh, great worker, and. Um, you know, you'll just have a good time. So uh, go to caulifloweralleyclub.org, um, check it out. Um, we, we sell out every year, so I highly recommend that you um, book your plane ticket. Uh, while it's early, it's always cheaper to book your plane ticket the further out. And uh, make your room reservation. Uh, go to the Gold Coast Hotel. Everything's on the website again at caulifloweralleyclub.org. And there'll be a thing called the pass key, and you just have to put one night's uh, room deposit on your credit card. Um, and um, the rooms are available from Saturday to Saturday. So our event is uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So if you want to come earlier, if you want to stay late, you, know, you still get those great room rates. And um, you know we're we're wide open to anybody that wants to come, as uh, long as you're a nice person. You're gonna have a good time, I promise. And there's a nice pool and jacuzzi at the hotel too. I made use of a lot last year. And I wasn't gonna ask you any fan questions, but there's a million people on here asking why you never turned on Brunzel and became a heel. Um, you know, we always have to uh, listen to uh, what the uh, hierarchies say. And um, they did, um, at one time in Philadelphia, Brunzi and I were gonna turn heel as a tag team. But uh, Vince and George Scott had promised us the belts three times. And each time, you know, a year go by, uh, six months would go by, when are we going to get the belts? You know, and it'd be the same answer. Well, you're going to get them soon, but you're making a lot of money right now. Everybody's making money, and there's more money in the, in the chase, George Scott's favorite line. There's more money in the chase than there is in the kill. That was the line. There's more money in the chase than there is in the kill. When the baby face is chasing the heel for the belt, you're going to draw more money because the fans know you can beat them. They've seen you beat them. And um, so, you know, it all makes perfect sense. But at some time, the fans are going to stop supporting you if you don't 
win the belts. And, you know, Jimmy wanted to still stay, and I'm at WrestleMania five, and I had given my notice uh, uh, a week earlier in Salisbury. And uh, Vince paid me. I didn't work, but uh, Vince was always great to me and um, good guy. Um, but we did WrestleMania two, WrestleMania three, WrestleMania four together, the first Royal Rumble together, uh, won the first Survivor Series together, went on the first overseas tour to Australia, the first overseas tour to Europe, uh, Kabbalah, Italy. Oh my gosh, what a blast. Um, just so many wonderful things. Um, but. You know, even after WWE, I mean, we were going from India to just all over the world because the tapes were like on a two-year, they were like two years behind. So we were like fresh meat for the next two years, every place we went. And so we were going places, drawing money. Um, uh, I went to Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. Um, just, oh gosh, so many places. It was, it was a wonderful time. but. Um, I, I, you know, we finally had to go to the Universal Wrestling Federation, uh, Dr. Steve, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, a um, uh, bunch of guys, uh, Danny Spivey, um, uh, there was some good talent there, but Herb Abrams wasn't the greatest promoter in the world, um, although they had a lot of money, uh, Herb went through that fast, but we were the, uh, the, uh, uh, not UW, UFC, UW, what was it, Universal Wrestling Federation, U, uh, UWF. Herb Abrams promotion. We were their world tag team champions, and I was uh, very blessed in my wrestling career. I I really enjoyed my singles career every bit as much as my tag team career. Um, you know, right here in Florida, being the Florida heavyweight champion two different times, that was a big deal in Florida then because you'd always wrestle the world champion. Um, you know, wrestling. Uh, uh, I think I I want to say that I beat. Um, Rick Rude for the Southern Heavyweight title. Rick was a tremendous wrestler. God, that guy could get heat like no tomorrow, and then he could give you a hell of a comeback. That guy was a total package. Rick Rude was one of the best workers. I mean, golly. And he wanted to do, to do this angle one time, and I'll shoot with you right here. And he said, uh, Brian, you and Eddie are pretty close. And he says, I think you can get this by him. And I said, what's that? He said, I got this angle I've been wanting to do for a long time. I said, well, what is it? Uh, he said, well, you know how I do the dance with the painted tights and all that? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm listening to him. And, now, this is a shoot. And uh, he says, uh, I want to get a giant dildo, and I'm going to slide it down my trunks. And, you know, I'll do the dance and everything, and you can imagine the fans' reaction. And I'm thinking to myself, well, where's, where's he going with this? And he said, yeah, uh, you know, we'll do a spot where the... Uh, Maybe I, uh, you pick me up for an ass bump or something. I knocked, hit the referee in the chin. He gets knocked out. Uh, you go to help the ref. You turn around. Now all the girls are going to think I got a big Johnson, and I'm going to pull that Johnson out and hit the referee over the head with it. Put it back in. He's going to count you down one, two, three. And what are the fans going to be uh, saying? Check his. <laughs> package, right? So I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, Rick, uh, there's a lot of kids out there. I don't think this is going to get over with Eddie. You know, this is uh, pretty strong. He said, come on, I know you can get it by Eddie. And I said, well, let's talk about it some more later. And he'd bother me by that. And he'd constantly ask me if I could talk to, that was like his all time dream was to do that gimmick. And um, <laughs> it would have been funny in an adult situation, but you can't do that kind of stuff with kids in the crowd. You know, it's just not a family friendly uh, type of thing, but uh, that shows how creative uh, Rick Rude's mind is. <laughs> and you want to tell us your personal social media for fans that want to follow you? Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at KillerB1B. Uh, I do have a Facebook account, KillerB account, um, and I'm on LinkedIn. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Cauliflower Alley has a Twitter too, right? Uh, Cauliflower Alley has a Twitter, uh, although I don't run that. Um, uh, David um, uh, runs that. Um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm available, I'm easy to get a hold of. You know, I love the fans. I mean, the fans have always been so good to me and I'm, I'm so deeply appreciative for that. Even now, you know, I'll be, uh, I was in Jacksonville the other night and it was like being in Jacksonville back in the 80s, you know, it was, it was great. And um, I'm still able to wrestle and 
I enjoy wrestling once in a while and, um, and with the right people. And uh, Where can they contact you for wrestling bookings? Uh, they can contact me at my, um, on my email, brianblair at brianblair.com and uh, um, hit me up on uh, Facebook. Um, that's uh, probably the easiest. I might not get to my Facebook for a week because I have so much going on between the Cauliflower Alley Club and I, I flip houses. I have three houses right now that I'm, uh, one's on the, just went on the market to, or one's about three months from the market and one's about five months from the market. So I'm busy with that. And I also uh, work a little bit in government with um, uh, political campaigns and um, mentor kids and um, do the Cauliflower Alley Club. So I'm very, very busy, but uh, I enjoy helping people. I mean, it just, warms my heart you know to, to help somebody I, I I actually got busted with food stamps um, here in Tampa Florida when um, my dad was a union carpenter and they went on strike and uh, all of a sudden powdered eggs powdered milk all this stuff kept, kept coming into our house and um, I was we had just got to Florida I was like 11 and a half years old and uh, 12 years old I was in uh, I was in fifth grade how old are you in fifth grade that's how old I was so um, then um, this, these sixth graders came to this uh, store, um, Philip Epperson, I remember he was a sheriff in Hillsborough County, that's where Tampa is, and um, he was in sixth grade and there was two other guys and they were like real rednecks, they'd want to beat you up for anything and um, um, you know I was just a little pudgy guy, not real tough then, um, and um, uh, they uh, started calling me really bad names and when I went to my my mom would drop me off to school and and kiss me and fortunately my mom's still with me and uh, and she lives in my guest house and I love my mom so much but we, she laughs about this a lot because she'd uh, I'd, I'd say mom you got to drop me off you can't kiss me in front of my friends so she'd drop me off like a hundred two hundred yards before the school and give me a kiss and I'd pretend like I walked to school and um, just uh, I walk up that next day after this food stamp event um, and uh, I see this green spray paint and these people all converged at the front of Egypt Lake Elementary School and I looked and they said there he is there's Blair oh look there's Blair and they're all whispering Blair Blair, Blair. and the, the nastiest words about anybody that I could think about would, were written in spray paint and green spray paint on Egypt Lake Elementary School so I ran home crying and I didn't ever want to go back to school and never and Mr. Agliano who taught both fifth and sixth grade reassured me that those guys would never mess with me and so I finally came back to school and um, realized that if you put your heart into something and if you really want to uh, succeed you know capitalism and the American way there's opportunity for everybody and you know I started uh, I had a lot lots of different jobs a lot of sales jobs sold cookware and stuff to China and cookware to single working girls got out my yearbook and hustle 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 so I was always you know bartended did things worked at Kmart as a shoe salesman um, did a lot of things that you know you just keep working and working and you finally find a goal and you reach that short-term goal and you make a new goal and ultimately you know then I wanted to be a professional wrestler and and uh, Lo and behold, uh, I was very blessed and um, I have had a wonderful career with the business and I thank everybody, everybody, whether you booed me, cheered me, talked bad about me, talked good about me, I just thank you for being there.